This is a relatively short lecture on the topic of frequency selective surfaces. And in fact, this can be short because of all the other stuff we've talked about. And in fact, I think what you'll see is you really already know what a frequency selective surface is and a lot of the theory behind them. There's some new concepts here that we'll talk about. I'll introduce frequency selective surfaces and give some simple examples. Then a big deal in frequency selective surfaces is something called grading lobes, which if you're following this lecture series that you'll know as diffraction orders. Then the real meat of this is the different classifications and comparisons amongst the different types of frequency selective surfaces. And at the end I want to throw in a special topic where I have some special experience and that's all dielectric frequency selective surfaces. So what is a frequency selective surface? Since we're calling it a surface, the assumption is it's a flat, planar type of structure that when you hit it with a range of frequencies, it either passes a band of those or it blocks a band of those. And really where these were made uh, famous was in the stealth aircraft, the stealth fighter, and that was just one of the mechanisms that were, were built into that to give it stealth. But in fact, frequency selective surfaces can do a lot of things that are very down to earth and not necessarily stealth. For example, if, if you have two antennas in very close proximity and one's transmitting and being received by the other one, we can encapsulate those in frequency selective ray domes where ray dome around antenna two will block the signal from antenna one yet let antenna two transmit through it. Uh, reshaping beams. There's a whole bunch of applications for frequency selective surfaces. Stealth, I think, made it famous, but a lot of other applications. Really, anytime we put a periodic structure on a flat surface, we get frequency selectivity. This is a rather famous frequency selective surface. This would be called a slot array. It's essentially holes punched in metal. And this particular structure is called a Jerusalem cross and it produces a frequency response, something like what a guided mode resonance filter does. But frequency selective surfaces come in all shapes and sizes. From a historical perspective, I want to mention that putting periodic arrays of metallic elements to do frequency filtering is not a new concept. In fact, on this slide is a patent by Marconi from 1919. So this is a very old concept. We might also ask the question, what physical mechanisms are there to produce a frequency response? And I would categorize them into two broad classes. One, we're absorbing energy. You hit a surface with a broad band of frequencies and certain bands get absorbed by the material or by the structure. The other thing we can do with that energy is to redirect it. And if we look at this almost from a thermodynamics perspective, these are really the only two things that, that can happen to the power in those frequencies. We either absorb it or we redirect it. There's nothing else that can be done. Now I want to step you through some pretty simple examples of frequency selective surfaces. And particularly the ones that I'm going to show you are historically important and still come up plenty often. The first one is something called a Salisbury screen. So imagine we have a, a big metal ground plane and a quarter wave in front of that we have some big lossy material. And when we hit this with a wave, this lossy material becomes a partial reflector. And of course the, the metal ground plane is a 100% reflector. But this lossy plane being a partial reflector, we get a Fabry-Perot cavity here, or a resonant cavity, and we get a resonance here. So the wave enters this, it bounces around a bunch of times, and any time that there's resonance, it enhances the loss. So we have a lossy mirror here. So where this is resonant, it would tend not to reflect at that same frequency. Other frequencies incident on this don't really resonate. They don't see nearly as much of the loss, and they tend to reflect much, much more strongly. So this is sort of a band stop filter, where we're stopping the band around a quarter wavelength. 
One area that is exactly the same theory where we see this is in dipole antennas. If we want to improve the bandwidth of a dipole antenna, what some people do is they put a resistive load a quarter wavelength from the tip, and that establishes a resonance at the tips of the dipole, and it becomes lossy. In fact, if we hit a dipole like that with an impulse, that will travel down the arm and tend to get absorbed in that resonant cavity, and we can, we can make dipoles larger and, and a bit broader band. So there's other places where this concept appears. If we wanted to enhance that, in our lossy material, we might also put resonant metallic elements that enhances the resonance and the reflection. We're still a quarter wavelength away from this metal ground plane, but this does the same exact thing on the previous slide, but with an enhanced response. And so this would be called a circuit analog absorber. On a related note on the absorption end, there's a, a big deal in metamaterials, these things called perfect absorbers. And the idea is that we can absorb 99 some percent of the energy in a single unit cell. So if you had a stack of just a couple of unit cells, you essentially absorb all the energy. And that's a big deal for a number of things, not only for frequency selectivity and maybe stealth, but also energy. If we could absorb a lot of energy, we could create heat and we could use that heat to generate power to drive electrical circuits or something else. Next concept is something called grading lobes. And I think you'll discover if you're following this lecture series that you're really already familiar with what this is. So looking at this from a microwave radio frequency perspective, we see a periodic metallic array. And we hit this with a wave and we see it reflect. As we, make, as we turn up the frequency, frequency is getting higher and higher, the wavelength is getting shorter and shorter, our wave is hitting a periodic structure. At some point, the period of that will be long enough to diffract into additional modes. And we've been calling those spatial harmonic, diffracted orders, etc. Well, microwave and radio frequency engineers call these grading lobes, but it's the exact same concept. Suddenly, the period of the frequency selected surface is large enough that it can diffract that ray into multiple orders, and those are called grading lobes. But I definitely want to point out the analogy between grading lobes and our diffraction. It's the same math, it is the same theory, it is the same thing. So what a radio frequency microwave person calls a grading lobe, uh, optics people tend to call diffraction orders or spatial harmonics or, or other things. Now we can use diffraction, diffracting into a different mode, as our mechanism for frequency selectivity, absolutely. However, usually the diffracted modes are seen as a bad thing and frequency selective surfaces are just designed for that zero order mode. And so we try to get the elements to resonate at low a frequency as possible, so that way you have to go to a much higher frequency before it starts to diffract and not work as well anymore. So hexagonal arrays tend to be the best for this. They tend to resonate at the lowest frequencies for a given lattice spacing. And so if onset of grading lobes is a real critical issue, you probably should look at hexagonal arrays. On to how the frequency selected surfaces are classified, and we can draw some comparisons and make some general conclusions that I think are useful. Let's look at redirection. And in my mind, there's three different ways to redirect power in waves. We can use what I would call a longitudinal resonance. So this acts like a stack of layers, a Bragg grading, if you will. And we either reflect or we transmit that. Assuming that the loss is negligible, this is not really absorbing. Although we could build an absorption, absolutely. But I would call this a longitudinal resonance. We also know from guided mode resonance that we can couple a wave into a guided mode and that scoots along in the transverse direction. I would call this a transverse resonance where we have energy propagating horizontally. And then of course there's also the diffractive where the energy is not traversing left and right, it's not resonating up and down, we just have infinite energy that gets diffracted into other directions. So we really have three different ways to redirect energy to give us frequency selectivity.
And before I leave here, let me give you one example of when a diffractive way of doing frequency selectivity is perfectly legitimate. It may be that we know the direction of our applied wave and we know we're obscuring something down here. So it really doesn't matter if we diffract it off into this direction as long as that power does not make it to where we don't want it to be. Now if we don't know the location of the bad guy or whatever we're trying to obscure this power from, then this is not a good idea. But if stuff like that is known, diffraction is, is a very valid mechanism for frequency selectivity. We also, we want our frequency selective surfaces usually to be as thin as possible. So going to multiple layers is usually seen as a drawback, but it can do some things for us. One thing it can do is improve the response. So here, we're looking at either a one or two layer, they're identical layers, but we stack them with some spacing. What we see is when we stack two, we get a steeper response and we just, it's much sharper. Well, for the single layer, it's a broader sort of smooth response. And in fact, the more layers we add, the sharper that response can get, the more it would approach, in this case, probably a rectangle type of response, but it's also bigger and bulkier. But if we need the stronger fre frequency selectivity, uh, a multiple layer structure is definitely an option for us. We definitely have to discuss dipole arrays versus slot arrays. So imagine we have a continuous sheet of metal and we punch out a bunch of holes, but these holes are not connected. So we would call this a slot array. Then if we take these little metal elements that we punched out and we form a complementary array, what we would see, ideally, is that their reflectance curves are exact opposites of each other. In fact, in principle, if we added these two, we would have a 100% reflectance all the way across. And that's called Babinet's principle. Now that's really only valid for uh, the ideal case where the frequency selective surface is perfectly thin, perfectly conducting. But even for practical cases, this is really close to being true. And it gives us a quick way to look at a slot array versus a, a dipole array and understand the differences. So a conclusion I would draw is that the dipole arrays are broadband transmitters and reflect uh, and reflect at narrow bands. So here might be the, the first band, but then there's, there's probably higher order bands of reflection. So it's a broadband transmitter and a narrow band reflector at certain bands. Likewise, the slot array is a broadband reflector and transmits at narrow bands. So again, they're complementary of each other. Another thing I'll point out is these dipole arrays, we can reproduce these res this response with all dielectric structures. I don't know of any way to produce the response of a slot array with a dielectric structure, at least a reasonably small dielectric structure. I don't know how to make a very, very broadband reflector with something that's compact. Literally, these slot arrays, they reflect from DC to daylight with bands of transmission. And I just don't know how to do that with a dielectric structure, although I'd be very interested in figuring that out. Back really to the, the one or two layer thing, uh, there's something interesting that happens that can be useful from time to time. Let's look at this top case. What we see is a thin sheet of metal surrounded on either side by a dielectric. And if we look at the field on resonance, this is what we see. We see a huge field that actually extends way far away from the, the metal surface. That can be a problem if there's something big and metallic out here. That will be interfering with the field and changing its response. Well, if we went to a coplanar array or a two-layer array, and we'd have the same metal screen, but now two of them on either side with dielectric sandwiched in the middle, this is now acting much more like a guided mode resonance filter where the energy is trapped between. And if we look at the field on resonance here, we definitely see that the field is trapped between the metal layers. There's very little field outside. And so in fact, something like this could operate uh, with big metal objects in pretty close proximity and it's isolated from them because the field is contained. So not only could it produce probably a stronger frequency response, the field is contained and this operates much more robustly 
in proximity to other devices. We can also make some conclusions about a frequency selective surface just from its symmetry. Now since we're talking about a surface, we're only talking about two-dimensional symmetry and we have five Brave lattices, if you will, in two dimensions. We usually want higher symmetry. That lets us, that, that pushes the onset of grading lobes out to a higher frequency, which is usually, uh, which is usually a good thing. We can pack more elements, so we get a stronger frequency response. So in this case, the hexagonal array of the five two-dimensional Brave lattices, that has the highest symmetry. That is usually the one that's preferred. It also will be much more robust to polarization and angle of incidence if we can get those elements spaced much more closely. So hexagonal arrays are usually preferred, but there may be times where we want a polarization response or something like that in which case we would start breaking away from the symmetry. Let's look at fill fraction here. Um, just to demonstrate that the hexagonal array actually has the best packing density. We can fit more elements in a given amount of space. So here's three different cases. We have a ruled grading type of case and A will be the lattice spacing so imagine it being the spacing between the dark bars here. R will be the radius of one of these bars. And so this is the fill fraction for the rule grading. Well, if we look at the fill fraction of a square array, where R is the radius of these circles, and A is the spacing from circle to circle, and a similar thing here, we can plot the fill fraction as a function of radius. And what we see uh, for the rule grading, we can actually get a higher fill fraction, and that makes sense because they're straight bars, they can fit right up against each other. However, that straight bar will have a very strong polarization response. So we tend not to see those. When we talk about the arrays, the hexagonal array has a much higher fill fraction with the with a highest possible fill fraction right below 91%. And the highest possible fill fraction for the square array is just around 79 percent. This is a really important slide for frequency selected surfaces and here we're talking about metallic frequency selected surfaces and we can make a lot of conclusions just looking at the element what is happening. Well if we have just straight metal wires sort of like what we mentioned on the last slide it has a strong polarization response. Well, that can be good if we want a polarization response. Maybe we want a polarizer. We can look at other type of elements, and all these elements have a size on the order of a half of a wavelength. If we look at an element like this, this would pack very nicely into a hexagonal array, and same with this one. So they tend to be very small relative to the wavelength. They tend to be very broadband. They carry all the, the benefits of a hexagonal array. We can pack them very, very tightly. Then we start looking at the elements that look more like a square array element. These tend to have very isolated resonances and, in my opinion, are better for narrow band type of applications. Then we have the swastika looking element and these are actually very interesting uh, they have a, a chiral response they tend not to be very studied simply because of the, the bad feelings associated with swastikas but from an electromagnetic perspective it really is an interesting structure then we can go down to more of the, the loop type elements and these are interesting in the regard that they tend to resonate at a wavelength that's governed by their circumference not their direct like size in the cross direction. So the circumference of these tends to be around a wavelength and that's where they resonate. So fractal frequency selective surfaces tend to try to fold the whole length into a much smaller element and that is mainly done so that the onset of grading lobes is even at a higher frequency because it's effectively electrically longer. Now that's a little bit more limited because if you meander a wire close to itself it tends to short circuit with capacitance and you don't quite get what you think you get. But you can, you can buy, yourself some, uh, buy yourself a lower frequency so that the onset of grading lobes is at a much higher frequency. Then we also have the solid type of elements, the plate elements. And these were some of the earliest studied, probably because they were the easiest to make, uh, probably the easier to model. But these tend to be very angle sensitive. The, the spacing cannot be as tight nearly as, as elements like this. 
So the onset of grading lobes is a problem. And we can also imagine all kinds of combinations of these elements and hybrids to take advantage of, of different aspects. So there really is a lot that we can learn about a frequency selective surface just by looking at the element that it's using. A quick sort of side topic here is the all dielectric frequency selective surfaces. This is very niche. Um, you won't see a lot about this, but there are times where this serves your application very well. Okay, so why an all dielectric frequency selective surface? What are these niche applications? Well, one is optics. Metals are very, very lossy at optical frequencies, and these Frequency selective surfaces tend to be resonant in some way. There's current resonating in the, the little metallic elements. And at optical frequencies, that's, that's huge. And that will that'll absorb a lot, a lot of power. At radio frequencies and microwave frequencies, that's not so much a problem. Metals tend to work better at those frequencies. That's why at microwave and radio frequencies, the frequency selective surfaces that you see almost all the time are metallic. It may also be that your frequency selective surface needs to be low observable. You don't want somebody to know that there's a frequency selective surface there. And if it's made of a, a periodic array of metallic elements, that's easy to see with x-ray imaging or something like that. Where if it's all dielectric, much more difficult to see what's going on there. Maybe you're handling your frequency selective surface in a very high voltage environment and you're worried about your frequency selective surface touching something and then you touch the frequency selective surface and it shorts out or other bad things happen. So if it's all dielectric, it's much safer to handle in these high voltage environments. In an area that we're studying are frequency selective surfaces for very high power microwaves. And if you've ever put metal in a microwave oven at your house cooking and you see sparks, that's what happens at a few kilowatts. Well imagine megawatts or gigawatts so we, we're looking at all dielectric approaches to overcome that. Another neat thing is that all dielectric frequency selective surfaces can be monolithic. Just one sheet of plastic with a bunch of bumps and grooves cut into it. Given that we don't want to use metals for whatever our reasons are, we have really eliminated a lot of tricks. We have a much smaller bag of tricks to produce frequency selectivity using just dielectric. So what's left? What can we do? Well, there's the stacks of layers like thin film optical filters. Well, that's great for optics, but if each of those layers are around a quarter wavelength and we need 100 layers, that's prohibitively large. We really can't do that. Maybe at terahertz type frequencies, that may be more of an option, but for radio microwave frequencies, we can't do that so much. There's also naturally absorbing materials. If you have a material that is absorbing just how you want it, that's probably the best approach. We could spray something onto a box and, and isolate it for, from whatever frequency that, that is absorbing in, and that works really well. However, that's not always possible. Diffraction gratings, that may be an option. What we've been focusing on are the guided mode resonance filters. There's problems with guided mode resonance filters, and we, we talked about it previously, but these particularly come up when we're talking about radio frequencies. They have limited bandwidth, limited field of view, and they're usually required to be hundreds of periods long. And so we really would like to overcome these problems in order to use them at radio frequencies. In some earlier work that we've done, we wanted to operate one of these things that really needed to be about 200 periods long. We wanted to operate this with just seven periods. So this is what we hypothesized, that we need a strong guided mode in the slab. This is a guided mode resonance filter. If we could put reflectors on the sides and also include a spacer region, and I'll tell you the, the utility of the spacer region in a minute, but if we make the, the back and forth path, an integer multiple of two pi phase, then in a sense this would unfold to an infinite array. And we included these spacer regions really to give us some control so that the round trip phase would be an integer multiple of two pi. So we built one of these. This is a relatively low contrast guided mode resonance filter and it needed to be about 200 periods long to work. So we put reflectors on either side. And if we took the reflectors away and we measured the response, we really didn't see anything from it. As soon as we included the reflectors, boom, we saw the, a nice strong resonance and that really confirmed this effect. 
One other thing we observe, I'm not talking about here, but we expected that the spacer regions would need to be some exact dimension for that resonance to be there. We actually found that not to be the case. We could really make those spacer regions anything, and the resonance would be there, and this actually let us control a little bit the position of that resonance. So that was a bit of a surprise finding. This is a summary of some other work we did a long time ago. But guided mode resonance filters, they have a limited field of view. In other words, they're very, very sensitive to angle of incidence. Well, suppose we wanted to put a guided mode resonance filter on a curved surface. The wave would essentially be hitting each part of the surface at a different angle of incidence. And so it wouldn't all resonate at the same frequency and it wouldn't work. So what we did is we developed a mechanism, and we can read about it in this reference here. We developed a, a way to chirp the period of this grating so that it's always resonant no matter what the local angle of incidence is. So we tested a flat array, and we saw, a, we saw our resonance not, not too strong. We took the same flat panel but put it on a curved surface, so we didn't, we didn't compensate for the curvature at all. And we measured it, and we saw very little. Then, we took a, a second surface that was actually chirped. Notice the period is shorter on the end than it is at the middle, and it was chirped to compensate for the curvature. When we measured that, we actually saw a stronger resonance than we saw for the flat case. Now, why on earth did this have a stronger resonance? Because we did two things at once. We not only compensated for the curvature of the surface, but we also compensated from the curvature of the source. It was uh, being illuminated from about 24 feet away, so this D distance was about 24 feet. So it was not a plane wave hitting, it was actually a slightly spherical wave, although it had a, a pretty large radius by the time it hit the surface. But since we compensated for both, we actually got a stronger resonance from it. So we were able to put a guided mode resonance filter on a curved surface and compensate for that curvature. So that's it. I do have some concluding remarks that I wanted to say about frequency selective surfaces. So our first conclusion is that we usually want as small elements as possible and packed as tightly as possible. If we do that, those types of frequency selective surfaces tend to be more broadband, more robust to angle of incidence, and the onset of grading lobes is also at a much higher frequency. We solve all that with really, really small elements and pack them as tight as possible. Now, clearly, at some point, we can't get a really small element to resonate at a longer wavelength, so there is a limitation, but overall, that's what we tend to want. The second conclusion here applies mostly to a metallic frequency selective surface, and the, the resonances are much more dependent on the resonance of the element than any kind of array resonance. So it's more the shape of the element that determines where it will be resonant than the spacing between them. In fact, we could take something where the element is resonant, and we could take the elements themselves and space them farther apart or bring them closer, and the response of the frequency selective surface is relatively robust to that. It will get weaker, but the position and the shape of that resonance really won't change. Now for the all dielectric frequency selective surfaces we talked about based on guided mode resonance, that is not the case. That is an array resonance. We couple into a guided mode, and that guided mode is scattering between adjacent elements in the array. Third conclusion, here we're just talking about the onset of the grading loop, uh, the onset of the grading lobes. That depends only on the element spacing, not the shape of the element. And also depends a little bit on angle of incidence. And then the last thing, the all dielectric frequency selective surfaces, they're not a catch-all. They're not going to replace the metallic frequency selective surfaces. But for niche applications, they can work better. So that's it for this lecture.